Hi everyone, it's Rob Timmings from ect for health Thanks for joining us again for another episode of Knowing Your Jargon. A question that comes up quite commonly in my emergency in-services and seminars is around the diabetic emergencies of diabetic ketoacidosis versus hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, DKA versus HHS. If both of these patients who present with these syndromes have blood sugar levels that are elevated, why does one make ketones and therefore become acidotic and the other not make ketones? Uh, It's a brilliant question and it probably is going to require a lot more than 15 minutes, uh, which is all we've got to discuss it. But I'm going to give it a really red hot crack. So let's get started without mucking around. Let's have a look at the fundamental differences between these two. So I'm just gonna blow this up so that we've got these differences between these two. First of all, diabetic ketoacidosis is diagnosed obviously by having an increase in blood glucose level and so is HHS, an increase in blood glucose level. So what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about uh, Australian values and we measure blood glucose levels in Australia in millimoles per litre. So millimoles per litre blood glucose levels to diagnose HHS, these are huge. They're certainly over 30. So over 30 millimetres of mercury are required to diagnose HHS. In diabetic ketoacidosis over on this other side, Blood sugar levels don't have to be significantly high. They're elevated, but we can go into diabetic ketoacidosis with blood glucose levels that sit around 15 or in in the low ranges of the 20s. They certainly don't have to be as high as what we have over here in the HHS patient. Another similarity is that because the blood has become very, very glucose rich, in other words, it's increasing in its, um, its osmotic pull of water into capillaries. If you think you've got a leaking pipe or a pipe with a semi-permeable membrane that's got very sugary fluid in it, the interstitial water in the cells that sit in the interstitial spaces around the outside of those, those uh, that, that, that glucose rich blood um, that water is going to be drawn or dragged towards the high solute or the high osmolality that glucose affords so as you can appreciate in hhs these patients with very very large glucoses have very many um, osmoles so milliosmoles is the measurement that we're going to be using and so they have an osmolality which usually exceeds 320, 300 and, where's my rubber? There it is, 320 milliosmoles. Over with the diabetic ketoacidosis patient, because their blood sugar levels aren't as significantly high, they do have a slight elevation in their osmolality, but generally that's not the issue that's going to be causing them the fluid and electrolyte shift that is so dramatically dangerous in my HHS patient. And this sort of brings us to our next real big difference between these guys. My HHS patients over here, these ones, they're the ones that are going to have a much higher mortality. Mortality rates are somewhere between 5 and 20% of patients who present with HHS. Whereas if we look at diabetic ketoacidosis, it tends to be a lot more explosive in its onset. We tend to pick it up the day that it happens or the next day. Uh, and, and so our, our mortality rate is a really only about 1% to 5% for diabetic ketoacidosis. So mortality is another sort of different factor. But ultimately, what is the fundamental difference here? Well, my diabetic ketoacidosis patients, these guys, it's all in the name, they make ketones. Ketones. And ketones are acidic. And because ketones are acidic, that pushes their blood pH down to below 7.3. Five, which is kind of our bottom edge of normal when we're looking at measuring the pH of arterial blood. Uh, if we were looking at venous blood, what I should do to try and use the colour a little bit more significantly, if we could look at 7.3. 
arterial blood. We know arterial blood's nice and oxygenated. So let's use arterial blood. Once blood glucose levels in an arterial blood gas drop down below 7.35, we'll call that acidosis. And let's go with that nice sort of purpley color. In venous blood, when blood glucose, uh, when blood pH levels, I should say, drop down below about 7.31. So venous blood gases, and up here, these ones are arterial blood gases. So whether you're using an ABG or a VBG, your pH of the blood is always going to be suppressed in a patient who has diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's the diagnostic point. They are a patient who is in extremis. They're in acidosis. And the acid that's causing their acidosis are these ketone bodies. So these guys over here, well, they don't make ketones. And the reason that they don't make ketones really comes down to what their underlying disease process is that causes their blood sugar level to rise. This is where we're going to flick across to a fresh page. So, just recap. We have a cell. There's our little cell. And what the cell has to have is glucose and oxygen. Oxygen. There it is, and glucose. The Krebs cycle is a, uh, a complex chemical process that occurs within the cytoplasm and within these little organelles of the cell that ultimately allows the cell to convert with the, with the help of oxygen to oxidize and convert to burn, I, I suppose, glucose into energy. And there's a whole video that I've done on this thing called the Krebs cycle. The energy is called ATP. I want to focus on this bit here. This tiny little bit down here where the glucose comes into the cell. As you know, for glucose to enter into a cell, it needs to be partnered with a hormone. And the hormone is called insulin. secreted from the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans. If insulin is present with glucose, then that glucose can be transported into your cell and then your cell is going to be a happy cell. There he is, little happy cell. Glucose can get in if insulin, like a key in the door, allows that glucose to get in. But we have these two different diseases. One is a family of diseases called type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes mellitus. And the other is a disease family of diseases called type 2 diabetes mellitus. And whilst everything exists on a bell curve and everything I teach exists on a bell curve, what we must understand is that the fundamental difference between a type 1 diabetes situation and a type 2 diabetes situation is that type 1 diabetes have no insulin. They don't make insulin. So in the type 1 diabetic, that's the situation. Glucose is present in the bloodstream, but it can't get into the cell down here because there's no insulin allowing it in. The type 2 diabetic typically is different. They do have insulin. In fact, many type 2 diabetics have more insulin than somebody who doesn't have diabetes. They become resistant to their insulin. So as their insulin starts to become less and less effective, they actually just have to produce more of it. So they start making much, much more insulin. So in many respects, somebody, if we could measure the blood insulin levels of the type 2 diabetic, the typical type 2 diabetic picture is going to have an increase in insulin. But because their insulin is broken, it doesn't work. They're insulin resistant. And then, of course, the glucose can't get into the cell. My cell's going to be an unhappy cell. There he is. Let's turn him into an unhappy cell. My cell's going to be unhappy and is not going to be able to make the ATP that it requires. 
Can you see that whether I have type 1 diabetes and I don't make insulin, or whether I have type 2 diabetes and my insulin is resistant, ultimately glucose is not moving from the blood into the cell. And for that reason, blood glucose levels are going to increase through both of those states. And so here we are at the disease state of diabetes mellitus. Whether you're a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic, a type 1 with no insulin or a type 2 with insulin resistance, you've got a situation where you have hyperglycemia. Now let's come back to this HHS versus DKA. Patients who develop HHS, these are type 2 diabetes. More than 90% of them will have type 2 diabetes. They won't have type 1 diabetes. Patients who develop diabetic ketoacidosis, 90% of them will be type 1 diabetics. Remember the difference here is that these guys have got insulin. And these guys have got no insulin. And that's the fundamental difference. So a reasonable question from here then would be, well, why is it that if I make no insulin, where does that link into ketones? Well, I'm really glad you asked the question. Let's go over here. Insulin has three jobs. Insulin does three things in our physiology. Its first job is to transport glucose into the cells. And that's so that cells can have fuel. The second role of glucose is to, of insulin I should say, is to store glucose in the liver and skeletal muscle as a long chain polymer called glycogen. And the third role, and arguably the most dominant role of insulin, which is a hormone classified in the world of biology as a growth hormone. It's a growth hormone. Where some hormones are involved in growing hair, and some are involved in growing bone, and some are involved in growing muscle. Insulin is a growth hormone for fat. It's a fat growth hormone. And here is the truth of the matter. If insulin levels are elevated, if you've got an elevated insulin level, you are storing fat, you're not breaking down fat. You're only either storing fat or you're breaking it down and burning your fat. In a state of fat storage, this can only occur when you have insulin present. So now add to that situation a disease where a person has low insulin. What that means is that their fat cells, let's put a fat cell here, can release their globules of fat into the bloodstream. And when they do that, that fat is stored in your fat cells, your adipose tissue, is stored as triglycerides. 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 There they are. Triglycerides, once they're released from fat cells, remember they can only be released from fat cells if my insulin levels are low. In other words, I'm not making insulin. I don't have any insulin. Think the type 1 diabetic patient. Then these triglycerides are going to be released out into the bloodstream. And as the triglycerides are released into the bloodstream, they go to a number of different organs in the body where they're oxidized, where they're burned. 
triglycerides in the liver are converted into ketones or what's called ketone bodies ketone bodies and these ketone bodies are acidic so let's recap if I have no insulin then I break down fat If I break down fat, I make ketone bodies in my liver. And if I make ketone bodies, that makes me acidic. What sort of acid am I making? These are diabetic keto acidosis occurs as a result of that. So my type 1 diabetic patient can make ketones and they can make ketones because they don't have insulin. My type 2 diabetic can't make ketones because often they have an abundance of insulin and remember insulin is my fat storing chemical. An absence of it causes me to make ketones an abundance of insulin causes me not to be able to make ketones. And that's the fundamental difference why diabetic ketoacidosis has ketones and HHS doesn't. Complicated, but simple, but complicated in its simplicity or simple in its complexity. Anyway, there it is. I hope that answers the question. Let me know in the comments if you want any other information. and I'm very happy to do another video to unpack some of that stuff.